thank you for your goodness and I thank you for everything that you did for us through your son. Father, I ask that for that I will have an ear to hear today what you want me to share, that I can continue to share the simplicity of what prayer is and what prayer isn't, so it can continue to set us free. And Father, I ask for many uh, testimonies to come as a result of this teaching, that many lives will be transformed in their relationship with you, that they'll just be able to connect with you so simply and so powerfully. And I thank you for that, Father. Amen. As you can see, and I, I say this every week, I'm really passionate about seeing believers just simply connect with the Father. Just get past all the man-made stuff and just to, to know him as he is, uh, just on a day-to-day -day level, you know. Um, and so I've really enjoyed sharing this um, prayer uh, series with you. Uh, I didn't actually think, Sean and I both didn't think it was going to be as big as what it was when we first started, but uh, we thought maybe eight to 10 lessons, but it looks like going to be close to double to that by the time we've covered everything that we'd like to cover. But as you know, we, we like to dot every I and cross every T and cover a few different scriptures with you. So I hope you're enjoying the journey as much as we are enjoying studying and sharing it with you. So today uh, I'm going to be continuing in my series on our prayer and uh, press the wrong button there and that is on today's lesson is on dysfunctions of prayer so i'm going to expose some of the more of the man-made traditions and doctrines and just once again bringing it through the lens of what we now have through the finished work of the cross and i call it dysfunctions of prayer because anything that puts us on the wrong side of the cross anything that causes us to to be in a lack mentality and where we're trying to get what we've already got it causes a dysfunction in our prayer life and in our relationship with god so there's about five uh, main things that are taught or believed across christendom that i just want to expose and uh just bring through uh that finished work in the new covenant just to help you now for the most part, it's going to be a, a summary of what I've already shared, but I really believe that this message is going to be a, a blessing to you and just help you to continue to renew your mind uh, so you can just simply connect with the Father through faith in Jesus alone. So I'm not going to go through this, but this I've put up, if this is the first message that you've heard um, from on this prayer series on dysfunctions of prayer, I just wanted you to know that this is what we've uh, shared on to date. So there's like, I think there's like a 11 messages there um, which we've done so far so they're all going to be up on my youtube channel which is on nerida walker um, so i have, have created a new prayer list called new covenant prayer so every week we're going to be uploading a, um, a new message that we've recorded and so this is where we're at today today i'm teaching on dysfunctions of prayer and uh, so in the future, what we'll be going through, I'll be doing a lesson on binding and loosing and the prayer of agreement, um, intercession and praying in tongues, uh, going to do a lesson on unanswered prayer, uh, then what new covenant prayer looks like. And really, I think it's important because the majority of the questions that I've been asked in my prayer sort of questionnaire slash survey is how do you hear the Holy Spirit when praying? Like, what does that look like? and just some practical examples. So that that's because it's a majority of what I've been asked, I think it's um, imperative that I put it at the end of this series. So I'm hoping that um, this, the, the whole lot, it looks like it's gonna be like 20 lessons, but I hope that it's just helping you just with line upon line and precept upon precept about the simplicity of what prayer is and also what prayer isn't. So again, I've already shared this, the dysfunctions of prayer, really. And that's the other thing that um, I've seen within this prayer questionnaire. A lot of people have, have commented and said, like, I just, I, I hope I'm praying correctly. I really want to know how to pray correctly because I want to be heard and I want to experience the answer to prayer. And who doesn't, right? We all want to start seeing answers. Um, but, you know, really, we do need to understand that the prayer is not like activating a genie in the Bible. God is not like a genie in the Bible where we've got to summon him up through faith and prayer or whatever uh, to get him to respond to us. And really, God doesn't need to be emotionally stirred to respond to man either. 
and it's just that's just one of the big dysfunctions that we have in our belief system so once again i'm going to cover five different uh, or make five common i believe the most common dysfunctions that we have in our prayer life and what we've been taught in christendom as a whole so and i just pray as i expose these um you all will already know what they are as i go through them but I just really believe that to package this in this lesson is going to be a blessing to many. So um, here we go. Okay, why is that not? There we go. So just to begin, I just want to make it so clear. There are no formulas or methods when it comes to prayer. Okay, and just really when in, you know, and I'm guilty of this to a certain extent, that when we get answers to prayer and we sort of seem to get a breakthrough in that area and we kind of work out how prayer works, what we do, especially those uh, in um, uh, the, the pulpit or in you know, main arena, they end up writing a book and then teaching on it. And so you get things, you know, titles of messages and books on, you know, like five steps to or 10 steps to a more effective prayer life or um, to get rid of blockages to unanswered prayer or even books on uh, in containing just prayers that avail much and just sort of little prayers that are outlined for you that you can just pick up and, and off you go. But really, when we start to look at um, this type of teaching, it really does put the focus on us and how we pray and what we do um, to get that breakthrough. So it kind of can put us in a bit of a self-effort mode. And again, it really does cause a dysfunction because we, as we follow all these steps, what can happen is we bypass the cross and, and take our eyes off Jesus and what we already have through him. Now, in my books, I do have uh, prayers that I have uh, written out. And I've also got prayer points. And I really felt that was uh, important to include those in both God's Plan for Pregnancy and It Is Finished, um, just as a starting guide to help people to begin to pray. And I think I've just fleshed it out throughout the whole, uh, both of those books, that it's not a method, it's not a formula. Um, it's just a guide to help you to begin to pray, to know, you know, one, to know what's available to you in the word, uh, what Jesus has done for you, and then just a simple, practical way of how you can pray or apply it to your life. I never intended it to be anything other than that. But unfortunately, over the years, um, I've lost count of how many emails and messages I get of, you know, well, I've prayed, I did everything you said in your book, I prayed all those prayer points, I even prayed those prayers every day, but either I still haven't had my breakthrough or I, you know, if it was a threatened miscarriage, I still lost my baby. So your book doesn't work, you know, or whatever. And, and once again, I think I really have put uh, within both books that the importance of revelation that it's not a formula it's not a method it's that so through relationship and through a personal revelation is where we start to experience the breakthrough so um i just wanted to cover that because i know i have included prayers in my um in my books but it was never intended to replace a personal relationship it was always there as a guide as a starting point to help people that are first learning about uh, what was available to them in the word but anyway remember this is our definition of prayer um you can pause this if you're watching this on youtube because i've covered this slide in every single one of our prayer lessons and i will continue to do so because this is something we really need to understand that prayer, when you see the word prayer, praise, prayed, praying in uh, the New Testament, it's this word pro acumi. Uh, it's two words, which means essentially towards an exchange. Okay, so it's prayer is a mutual exchange or it's a communion, joint fellowship, where we commune with the Father, where we can exchange. Um, you know, through that communion, we can partake of one another. Prayer is how we commune with God. Prayer is how um, we connect with him. Prayer, through that prayer is, uh, through. and that's the definition of when I say the word prayer and pray, this is what it is. It's basically relationship, spending time with God, getting to know him. He already knows you. He's known you before you were born, but it's how we can get to know him, know his heart, and where we can learn to hear his voice so he can guide and he can lead us. It's so easy, right? Um, so really that's it, simple. I can just go now and finish, that's it. That's what prayer is. <laughs> but unfortunately there's so much stuff that we've been taught over the years that we really do need to expose and unlearn. 
Um, the other thing I just wanted to address just very quickly today, don't want to spend too much detail, but this was the order I was taught and this is how I was taught to pray. I found this list uh, in my notes that I had created years ago uh, through different teaching that I'd had, whether in church or from other people I'd followed um, on um, Christian television back in the day before internet. Um, gosh, uh, exposing my age there. But um, this is basically how uh, I was taught to pray. First, it was to pray in tongues, uh, then to repent and seek forgiveness because god isn't going to hear you if you've got any you know unresolved sin in your life or anything like that um then uh, i had to thank him you know into the gates with thanksgiving and then into the courts of praise so then praise and worship as well um then i had to bind the gates of, of hell <laughs> loose the gates or storm the gates of heaven and we'll be covering that in binding and loosing and then then's the petition then when you've got all that done then it's a time to really hit god up for what you really need whether it's uh stuff for yourself or stuff for other people um and then uh then you had to make sure that you declared scripture that you had scriptures to back up that prayer because you got to remind god of his word and then make sure at the end you say in jesus name amen <laughs> so sean's already done a message on that we've uh we will have that up on our um, my youtube channel really soon so in jesus name amen just simply means in the authority and who we are in christ and amen means it is finished so be it uh so simple isn't it so this is pretty much what i was taught about the order of prayer but, and then um, you may have heard of this method. This is called ACTS and Billy Graham and others have taught on this and, and you know, the ACTS prayer mo method or model. So it was adoration, you know, so praise and worship, then confess because you've got to get clean of your sin. Um, thanksgiving uh, from the previous prayer and thanking God that he's already going to answer your prayers even though you haven't heard him up yet. And then you can supplicate. Okay, but with what I was shared previously with what I was taught and even this, it's really not a good model on how we approach God. It's a method, it's a formula. And really when we start to follow methods and formulas over relationship, I think we've got problems. And uh, I just wanted to share this. That these are some scriptures that have really blessed me in my journey and my relationship with God. And, you know, ultimately, I want you to come and, and just be left with Jesus and Jesus alone and know that it's a prayer is relationship is how you relate with God, how you commune with him. And really, and I've shared this, I think, in every lesson that really, when you understand the finished work of the cross, what really should change is our prayer life, because when you know what Jesus has already done for us and what we have now in through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, our prayer life should be radically transformed. But because we've got all this dysfunction in our teaching and tradition and doctrines of men, it's like most believers are, are left confused uh, of what do we now do? What do we do? And because we don't want to offend God and we don't want to get anything wrong, we just sort of go with the flow, don't we? We don't really question why we do what we do. But, uh, you know, always remember prayers that exchange. I've already covered that. But I, I love this scripture. This is God's will for, for us. You want to know God's will for your life? I love this scripture. And John 8, 40, sorry, John 6. <laughs> I need to make this text bigger. 40 says, for this, Jesus is speaking. And he says, for this is my father's will and his purpose that everyone who sees the son and believes and cleaves to and trusts in and relies on him should have eternal life and i'll raise him up from the dead on that last day so god's will and his plan and his purpose for you is to experience is to come into relationship a saving relationship through what jesus has done through his finished work and the goal is eternal life okay john three sixteen. those who that you will not perish but have eternal or everlasting life so what is eternal life it's not just going into heaven with a sweet by and by Look at this. John says this is what eternal life is in John 17, 3. He says this is eternal life. It means to know. And the Amplified here says to perceive, recognize, become acquainted with and understand you, the only and real God. And likewise, to know him, Jesus, as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, whom you have sent. Okay, so eternal life is to know and experience the Father and the son 
that is what eternal life is relationship okay and the other scripture that i just wanted to get to is you know what god requires of us because i just want us to get past the rules the regulations that what we have there's so many in christendom you know there's you know whether we we feel like that or not this in a church life and and just what we've been taught over the years there's so much stuff that's put on us of what we must do what we must not do and it's just we start living our christian life based on rules and regulations and methods and formulas so i want to encourage you to throw all of that out and or just to put it to the side because you want to have revelation on what you do put it to the side and just start to live by relationship day to day by being led by the father okay and so you don't believe me it's all about that simple look at this john 6 25 28 sorry to 29 and it says then they said what are we to do that may, we may habitually be working the works of god what are we to do to carry out what god requires and so, you know, that's a pretty big question. And so Jesus replied and said, this is the work, the services that God asks of you, that you believe in the one whom he sent, <laughs> that you cleave to trust in and rely and have faith in his messenger, which is Jesus. All God requires of us is faith in his son to stop performing and stop struggling and striving in our self effort to try and do what God's already done through his son for us. You know, it's just remember, we've got a faith covenant faith. The only thing that pleases him is faith. And that's when we're resting in Jesus performance uh, and not our own. It's so simple. So I want you just to remember that, that that's what eternal life is. That's what salvation is. That's what the Christian life is. So now with all that said, we're going to cover five common, most common, what I believe dysfunctions of prayer. Okay. You ready? Cause this is more unlearning. Once again, we've already covered uh, most of this in other, uh, in this prayer series and also in other messages in church. But I really do believe that uh, to package it in this lesson is going to be a blessing and just really confirm um, what we've already covered so far. So the number one dysfunction, I believe, and again, this is not a method or a formula, even though I've got five points, okay, <laughs> is the, the, and this is the biggest dysfunction in Christendom full stop, not just with prayer, but with how we relate with God, okay, and it's that what we do moves God, and it is the biggest dysfunction because it's not true, it's not the truth at all, because we're taught that faith, prayer, fasting, and all the stuff we do is moves God. But God already moved when he sent Jesus on the cross over 2000 years ago. Faith and all that stuff moves us, you know, it doesn't, we don't earn, we learn. We do that stuff to learn, you know, to find a connection, to get revelation, to learn what God has already done for us. So generally speaking that, you know, as a, as a church and the big church, Christendom as a whole, when we have national days of prayer and fasting, or we have prayer vigils, or even just our basic prayer meetings is really the, the, the main, I suppose, the um, goal, I think, or, or the outcome that many believe of what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing is that they're going to get God to release something to them, whether it's for anointing or for their breakthrough or even for revival. Um, and, and really that is the motivation of why um, most prayer meetings and prayer vigils happen. We're trying to get God to release something or get God to do something for us. Um, as we go for a bit forward, we're going to be talking about binding and loosing prayer of agreement, intercession, what that is and what that isn't, and even praying in the spirit. So I will continue sort of on that sort of thing because there's a whole prayer network uh, within Australia and beyond um, that, um, yeah, that I just really believe that we really need to, whatever we're taught, whatever we're told, we still need to, need to filter that through the finished work of the cross. And, and really the, the ultimate belief here or the common, most common belief is that the more people that pray, uh, the more power we have, or the more we pray, the more amount of, of uh, quality, you know, so rather than praying for five minutes, you get this much, <laughs> this much power. But if you pray for two hours, you get this much power. You know, it's almost like that belief system. The more you pray, the more power you have, or the more people you have praying is the more power you have. 
And I love how Jesus was one person and he changed a nation. He changed the world. He only had 12 disciples, well, 11 really. And I just love that. Um, he didn't have millions and millions of people. I mean, he does now through uh, the finished work of the cross, but I just think that we've ju just the man-made stuff. Um, it really does distort uh, what we believe about God and how we feel that he responds to us. I have no problems with prayer meetings. Don't get me wrong. I think they're powerful when we know um, what we can expect from them and how we can sharpen one another and encourage one another. I think they are important, but not if we're thinking that we're going to get God to do something for us. I think that is a misconception, uh, really. It just And we do bypass that cross and it does create a dysfunction in our relationship because then we put that and translate that into our own personal prayer life. Okay, always remember the Bible is very clear that we already have access to everything of the kingdom. The kingdom of God now lives and dwells in us. We have access to the very nature, the character, the, the wisdom of God, the revelation of God, the understanding of God, the power of God through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We already have that access, okay? We have everything we need for life and for godliness. So this is why it's so important we understand and always bring to mind that finished work of the cross. And so like I shared at the beginning that what we do through prayer or fasting or even faith, you know, declaring the word, all that stuff of what, um, you know, we've been taught in the past and even what I've taught myself in the past is that that stuff doesn't move God. Why? Because God already moved over 2000 years ago. He gave us his very best when he gave us himself through the presence and the person of Jesus. Okay. So we've done this slide before, but this just as what, you know, under this banner of what we do moves God, just this is what we've covered in previous lessons. So many believe that prayer is that God is reactive. You know, that, that prayer moves God. So, and then that we pray and then God has three main, an main answers. Yes, no, or wait. Um, no meaning it's not his will. Um, yes, then you experience the breakthrough or um, wait, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, actually, that's the next one. But, um, you know, that's, that's the three main answers that we have here. But what we believe that God is reactive, that we pray that God then hears us and then God then responds to us. But as we've discovered in this prayer series, and when we look at what we already have through Jesus and his finished work, God is proactive. God has already responded. Okay, his work is finished. And that's why we do need to understand what we already have. The other thing that uh, many believe that and what we're taught um, is that God's answers, like I just mentioned, are yes, no, and wait. But 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And I mean, means so be it, um, remember? So, and it was all taken care of the, uh, at the cross. The New Living Translation says, all the promises of God have been fulfilled in Christ. Okay, so when it comes to what Jesus has already freely provided, the answer is yes. Jesus is your yes answer, okay, to whatever he's provided for on the cross. And that's salvation and everything pertaining to salvation. Okay, that is God's will, plan and purpose for all of mankind. God provided that before we were born. Uh, doesn't mean that everybody experiences it. Um, there's many reasons for that. And we'll go through that a little bit when we go through my lesson on unanswered prayer. But we know for certain that it's never that God has broken his word or altered his covenant and uh, withheld the healing blood and the redeeming blood of Jesus from anybody. Okay, that is so important. We understand what we already have, that God's will is Jesus. Jesus is God's answer for suffering. It's so easy. The other thing that uh, many believe that um, when it comes to prayer and even our relationship with God, that many rely on God's sovereignty. Um, so, you know, the whole saying God's in control. Um, but if God was in con really in control from what I see through the Bible, especially when it talks about the new heaven and earth, is that there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no suffering, there's no tears, there's no sorrow. That's a time where God will be in control, right? Um, so, and so when people say when God's in control, I think if God was in control, we wouldn't have sickness and disease. We wouldn't have, uh, failing relationships. We wouldn't have, you know, uh, all this stuff that happens in while we live in this fallen world. 
so god's sovereignty or you know they're relying on god's will but remember god's will is jesus and what jesus has already provided remember we covered this in god's sovereignty and prayer lesson you know at the end of is god in control um those three messages is that god created us in his own image and he gave us dominion power and authority over the works of his hands so through what we know now through jesus and his finished work we have authority you know we really need to be starting to exercise authority over what we face in this fallen world you know jesus has paid the price for all of us he's equipped and he's empowered us with everything we need to continue to advance god's kingdom you know he said you will do what i do and greater things because i because of my spirit you know because of him you know the same power that anointed jesus the same power that rose him from the dead lives and dwells in us so we can do what he did and greater things so you know it, i think to to say god's in control and just leave it um it really we are submitting to the situation and we are lacking we suffer because we lack knowledge we don't realize that god has already provided and we can go and lay hold of what he's already done for us and so the bottom line is many believe that prayer is god hearing and then responding to us because god is reactive but i've covered god is not reactive god is proactive but prayer is God uh, is about us hearing and then responding to God because through hearing and responding, we hear him. He guides and leads us by his spirit and, and then we know what to do. He reveals Jesus and his finished work to us and then we know what to do. He will guide and lead us in that area and I'll cover that a little bit as we go on. So that is so important that we understand all those things. So what we do does not move God. Okay, God has already moved through what he did through the finished work of the cross. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he sat down. Okay, when we face stuff here on this earth, Jesus doesn't have to get up and go back to the cross. He doesn't need to take one more stripe for your sin. He doesn't need to be beaten, bruised and body broken for your sicknesses and diseases. His last words on the cross, remember, was it is finished. His work was a complete and perfect and finished work. That's why he sat down when he ascended into heaven. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Christianity isn't a list of do, 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 but it is done, done. It is finished. It is perfected by Jesus. So we need to understand that and learn how to rest in what he has done and then through relationship learn to just to flow and just to see his kingdom out working in our life. Okay, that's the first one, what we do moves God. The second dysfunction, I believe, is um, the big one is God and his word and faith in his word. And that is that we need to bring God into remembrance of his word or remembrance of his covenant. Okay, this is a huge one. So they teach, many teach that we need to find a scripture and then de declare that scripture or stand on that scripture and, um, you know, and hold God to that scripture, hold God to that word um uh, or his covenant um so it's again it's a reactive thing mindset isn't it we will get the word we will declare the word now god you need to fulfill your word god you need to respond your word i'm bringing you into remembrance of your word but can you see it's still reactive it still puts us on the wrong side of the cross especially when it comes to what we already have through salvation healing deliverance provision etc Okay, we have already been equipped and empowered with the Holy Spirit that he can give us the wisdom, the understanding, the revelation we need to be able to know what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go. Okay, and this is really important to know, you know, because God, bottom line, God has already not only spoken, but he has already fulfilled his word. John 1 and 1 verses 1 to 2 and then 14 and you can actually read the whole passage it's all speaking of Jesus right but I love these um, verses it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God who Jesus because then for verse 14 says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us other versions say tabernacled or was you know he was embodied in a human body dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth okay so the beginning was the word the word was with god 
the word was God. God spoke Jesus, okay? That Jesus is the spoken word of God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, all the promises were fulfilled in Jesus, remember. Ultimately, scripture points to Jesus. You know, um, many believers are so hung up. I believe, and I was there myself, I've been there myself, and I have actually taught on this myself, that you need to find a scripture that you can stand upon. And yes, you do, but as long as you know the the context of why, which I'll cover in a second. But it's not about finding a scripture that pertains to your situation that you then stand upon it, declare it and claim it, and then remind God of it as like he's going to fulfill it or perform it for you. Okay, why? Because all scripture points to Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 10, 7, Jesus says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Okay, the volume of scripture, it all points to Jesus. It's a type and shadow of Jesus and his finished work. Amen. That's what I love about the author of Hebrews, how he goes through how Jesus is better and greater than everything that the, the children of Israel had under the Mosaic law. And I love, I mean, I I must share this scripture with you, um, I think probably nearly every second message. I love it. It just really resonates with me, Um, just from where I was and to where I am now. In John 5, 39, Jesus, he said to the the Pharisees, you know, you search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, you know, or other translations say, but they witness of me. So here were the the Pharisees so hung up on the literal word. It it is written, it is, you know, and they were so hung up on the law and the written word, but he was the living word in front of them. And he's saying, you're searching the scriptures because you think you have eternal life through them. But he says, but they all witness of me. They all point to me. And here I am, it continues, here I am standing in front of you and I'm wanting to give you eternal life. But he says, you're not willing to come to me. And I believe sometimes if we're so hung up on trying to find a scripture and declare a scripture for our situation is we do bypass Jesus. We're so, whether it's for um, a healing of any condition or provision or whatever, we're, we're trying to find this scripture for healing of a particular situation, but here's Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And you have Jesus right in front of you. You have the finished work right in front of you. And I believe by his spirit, he wants to give it to you, reveal that eternal life to you, knowing the father, experiencing the father or experiencing what he has done but we are so hung up on the literal that we we miss it, you know. So never forget the author is still alive. The author lives in you. You know, why run after healing when you have the healer? Why run after provision when you have the provider? Where is he? By his spirit, he lives and dwells in you. You have access to everything you need for life and for godliness. Okay, so scripture, the word points ultimately to Jesus. You know, and again, remember the word, uh, if it point, it points to Jesus and it's been fulfilled in Jesus. These are just three of my favorite scriptures that I used to um, stand upon. You know, I just really, they just really, I suppose, resonated with me when I first began to discover that the, God's word was living and active and powerful. Um, Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. And, and if you keep reading around it, it's such all of Isaiah 55 is beautiful, a uh, beautiful passage. But, you know, God says here, for as the rain comes down uh, and the snow from heaven and and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Okay, so you know you can say okay well i've got scripture and god this is your word it says here your word will not return to you void absolutely when you know that all scripture points to jesus and that jesus has already fulfilled what god has spoken okay so it's not like you grab a scripture on healing and go right god you need to fulfill this scripture it says by jesus stripes i'm healed i'm standing on this word i'm declaring this word so now god this word's not going to return to you void it has to produce in my life that word by Jesus stripes I'm uh, uh, healed, which is in Isaiah 53, 4 to 5, is pointing for us post cross of what we already have because Jesus has already done it, hasn't he? He's already provided healing. 
okay so god's already performed that word through what he did through his son okay and this is just another scripture that i used to love in jeremiah 1 12 it says the lord said to me if seen correctly for i'm watching to see that my word is fulfilled again jesus has already fulfilled his word so just be careful when you find these scriptures that you don't use these to back up that i need to grab the word and i need to declare the word because again it puts you on the wrong side of the cross and it's dysfunctional because you're operating under the wrong covenant it puts you in a position of lack rather than in a seated position where it's jesus is more than enough for you you know the bottom line is that we want something to do and believers you know it's not enough just to rest in jesus and that's the biggest struggle for most of us to know that jesus is enough full stop end of story it's it's you know it's very challenging especially if you're a doer especially if you you love to get in and to to pray and to declare and to do everything you can um it is such a steep uh uh unlearning learning curve really is but i tell you life on the other side because i've been on both sides i tell you it is such a joy and such a rest to just enjoy your journey your everyday journey with the lord this is just another scripture that's used to in that we need to hold god in remembrance of his word is luke 138 when mary after she was told by the angel that she was going to be pregnant by the whole through the holy spirit and uh carry the messiah jesus she said um behold the maid servant of the lord let it be unto me according to your word and the angel departed to her so again this was fulfilled and everything was fulfilled through jesus ultimately this was speaking of jesus that happened it's done it's finished jesus has come and completed his work so just another thing to note that all the scriptures and everything that talks about putting god in remembrance reminding god of his covenant reminding god of his word what that he's watching his word to fulfill all that stuff the majority of it you know 99 percent of it is all under the old covenant and this is why we teach you that when you're going through scripture but before you appropriate it to your life is to look at the context who is speaking what to whom and why what covenant were they under you know etc etc all that sort of stuff so then you can look at okay what covenant am i under does this apply to me do i need to appropriate this or is this something i've already got through jesus okay so the bottom line for us under the new covenant is the remembrance is for us not for god because god has already performed his word through jesus we have everything we need through the finished work of the cross and through the ministry of the holy spirit under the new covenant which is a faith covenant and which is not by your might not by your power but by the spirit of god and it's such a simple and easy uh way to live and, and to rest in him okay so we need to constantly remind ourselves of that finished work because there is all this stuff in this teaching that really does need to be exposed and we really need to be delivered from you know um or transformed in our thinking is another way i could say that so it's not like you need deliverance per se but just a need to renew your mind to transform your thinking and, and this is just a really brief thing when it comes to the word of god and this is just a simple thing that i teach on just to keep it simple once again it's not a method or a formula but just a simple way to help you in your journey and that's when it comes to um uh, god's word and faith and everything else it's just very simply information revelation application so when it comes to god's word the word brings information it shows god's will plan and purpose for you and it outlines his covenant for man so it's not like you got to grab find a scripture pertaining to your situation and, and stand on it declare it and then and and put god in remembrance to it to perform it i've already covered why okay but it's there for information and so that's there for you to show you and to help you to renew your mind from what your natural circumstances say or, or what you've you've um, learnt today to find hang on it is god's will for me to be well it is god's will to me for me 
um, to succeed in life. It is God's will. Yes, I live in a fallen world with fallen men. And yes, there's an adversary, but Jesus, you've provided a way out for me. Jesus, you are my answering answer for suffering. That through my relationship, I can learn to grow in you and walk with you and to experience a different outcome as I grow in that area. Okay, so it's not about just that. So the word is for information. We then need revelation. And really that's when we, we, a simple way you can meditate on that word. You can declare that word. But again, it doesn't move God. God's already moved. It's not to earn, but to learn. As you meditate, as you declare, it's to help you. It's to encourage you. It's to remind you. So it, just all in that mind renewal process to transform the way you think. And then through relationship is where the Holy Spirit will quicken or bring that to life. It may not be a scripture. It might just be an inner knowing that you know it's done, you know it's finished. Um, and that you can't, um, I can't really teach you what that's like. You'll know when that rest comes. You'll know when that revelation comes. That's relationship. That's between you and the Father. Um, I will talk a bit about how to hear from God and ways, practical ways. Uh, but ultimately, that is your journey. And it'll be a fun journey as you learn just to rest and, and know that Jesus is enough. Okay, so that's uh, information, revelation when it comes to God's word and then application. So if you know the example healing, if you know what Jesus has already done, you can get Isaiah 53, 4 to 5 that says, by Jesus stripes, I am healed. 2 Peter, 1 Peter or 2 Peter 2, 24 says, by Jesus stripes, we were healed. Peter's looking back to what Jesus has done. So Jesus has provided healing for me. So I have that word. That word has given me information. And then as you meditate on that and maybe some other scriptures or even just spending time with God, the revelation will come. And the application is simply that if you experience any sickness and disease on your body or any symptoms, and whether it's for you or for someone else, you just go, you know what, uh, you know, get off. You then begin to minister the kingdom to yourself or to other people if they're sick. And you know what you do? You take authority over that symptom. You take authority over that condition, over if it's you, over your own body, because you have more authority over it than God has. And you have more authority over your own body than I do or any other believer has. And you go, you know what? Sickness, get off. You know, whatever that condition is, Jesus paid the price by Jesus stripes. Healing is available to me. So with the authority I have in Jesus, you can, you know, get off my body and then just go, you know, declare healing body. Stop reacting to this condition. Stop reacting to this fallen world. You will just get into line with the finished work of the cross and be healed. And then through that uh, is where prayer comes. And remember, prayer is not asking God to do anything because God is proactive, not reactive. It is hearing and responding. So in that journey, it's not just doing information, revelation, application, but it's hearing. So if the Holy Spirit says, you know what, say if it's a sickness and disease, if the Holy Spirit says, you know what, you need medical help, go get checked out. Or you know what, that operation the doctor said you need, for whatever reason, if you feel led to do it, let him guide and lead you by peace. Okay. Sometimes we think as believers, it's the supernatural or nothing, uh, but God will meet us where we are at. And sometimes we need help. Um, and there's nothing wrong when we need help. Even if it's, you know, you're praying for something, you see no breakthrough or you're declaring something, whatever, you know, through the dysfunction stuff, I might add is the Holy Spirit might say, you know what? ring so-and-so get so-and-so to just to pray with you or to to minister to you um to encourage you okay and so through that hearing and responding okay so through prayer remember prayer is not asking god to do anything so through communion through just hey jesus help me i don't know what to do here is the most powerful prayer you can pray remember that is where he will uh, reveal wisdom his wisdom understanding and sometimes even to have wisdom and understanding is enough to then know what to do with the application and so it really is that that's why relationship i keep saying relationship hearing and responding that's how we minister the kingdom to ourselves and that's how we minister the kingdom to others and uh you know oh it it is a journey we do need to learn and grow but it is that simple 
okay so we don't need to remind god of his word the word points to jesus and what we already have through jesus the third uh, dysfunction that we can have, the most common, is that we judge our relationship with God or the, our prayer life according to our circumstances. And I sort of touched on this a little bit la on the last lesson on praying for yourself, um, that we judge our relationship with God based on the level of our performance in our prayer life. But, but here, more specifically, that say for an example, healing, uh, we judge our prayer life or our relationship with God according to what we experience or what we don't experience. So with healing, if we experience healing, we go, well, there we go. I've had an answer to prayer. Okay. That's got nothing to do with you hearing and responding to God. Okay. And then if you don't experience healing, then it's that that's unanswered prayer. Okay. So then it's like, and that's where all the traditions and the doctrines of men have come from. Okay. So it's rather than Jesus and the finished work, and learning to hear and respond to the father we judge our relationship and we judge our prayer life solely on experiences and it's so incredibly wrong it's not a blessed way in any way shape or manner to relate to god um so and it, this is huge and we i will be going through this in, in a lot more detail in my message on unanswered prayer okay so we don't live by our our prayer life um and remember because prayer that whole prayer what i'm talking about there with prayer with healing is all comes from a dysfunctional way of we're trying to get god to move so if you see as god is unanswered then it, it, can you see it's a dysfunction because we've bypassed the cross we're relating to god under the wrong covenant we're not relating to him by faith through the finished work of jesus God will not, cannot block, stop or delay what he's already done through his son. He cannot step in and take back or undo what he's already freely provided. So that's why judging our prayer life or our relationship with God based on circumstances is so crazy. You know, it's through his word, it's through personal relationship uh, where we learn and we grow. Uh, that's a huge one. So I will go through that in a bit more detail uh, when I go through my message on unanswered prayer. But really what that causes us to do is if we perceive something as unanswered prayer, it just puts us in a place of where we start laboring and striving and we just get into all forms of self-effort. And really we, by that we judge God or we judge ourselves, you know, so we judge God and go, well, mate, you know, like I've covered, maybe it's not God's will, maybe God's saying, wait, maybe he's got a better plan for me, which is all man-made or we judge ourselves and we look and we become introspective and go, well, then maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I've got sin in my life. Maybe I'm not praying correctly. Maybe I don't have enough faith. And see, that's, it's just, that's where all the traditions and the doctrines of men have come from. It's not based on Jesus and what he has done for us. It's not based on relationship, but that then that introspective and that where we look at ourselves it's put the breakthrough on us and what we could have done or what we, you know, maybe I've missed something. Once again, you look into yourself and what you could have done in that situation. It's bypassed the cross. Okay. And so really, and that's why this, uh, I say it's a dysfunction because then it changes how we relate with God. We either feel that we're unworthy, you know, that God's bypassed us, God's not hearing us, you know, that, um, you know, we don't feel that we're, we're, we're unloved, we're worthy enough to experience. Um, or we feel that, you know what, God, you're a hard taskmaster, you know, that I've got to dot every I, I've got to cross every T. But either way, what it does, it creates a lack in us and it creates a striving because we want to be better. We want to do better. We want to fix it because we want God to hear us. We want God to respond to us. Then you see it's dysfunctional. We bypass the cross. We bypass Jesus. We go on the pre-cross looking towards God, trying to get God to move rather than knowing, hang on, I'm seated with you. Jesus has provided this for me. I mean, I go into detail on this in Jesus Finished Prayer and Jesus Finished Work is the title of that message. So when that's uploaded, you can uh, go through that and I'll give you a lot more detail on what we already have through that cross. Always remember, and I, I've covered this the last couple of lessons as well. We have a loving heavenly father. Any good earthly parent is not going to withhold anything good from their children. Uh, there's even a scripture that says that, that no good thing will God withhold from those who walk uprightly. How we walk uprightly is by our new covenant, which is a faith covenant 
we become righteous we become uprightly when we put our faith in jesus because jesus righteousness is imputed as a gift to us no good thing with god will god withhold but ultimately god has already in romans 8 paul says this he's already given us his very best when he gave us his son and he says so how will he not also along with him with jesus graciously give us all other things and because of, when we understand that finished work you realize we already have everything we need through the ministry of the holy spirit okay the only thing we're lacking is revelation on what we already have okay the father's role is to provide for the children the children don't have to beg for plead try and stir their father emotion, emotionally to provide for them to care for them um, a good earthly parent i'm talking about it's how much more so the heavenly father and when it talks when jesus spoke on this and he said ask and you receive seek and you'll find knock and the door will be open and he said you who are evil you know how to give good gifts to your children and the end of that scripture he said how much more will the father give you the holy spirit to those who ask and that we are post cross we already have the holy spirit that's why we need to understand our position in the new covenant and the finished work of the cross okay moving on the fourth point is uh, what we're taught another dysfunction is faith we must operate in faith now i've already covered a lesson i think it's the second the first lesson i did in this prayer series is the lord's prayer the second is the prayer of faith i also covered this when i went through the second message on james and prayer in james chapter 5 we covered the prayer of faith and the context of all of that and we saw that ultimately the prayer of faith is not about what you pray but it's about what you say it's about speaking to a mountain taking our god-given authority and applying it it's all to do with the application of what jesus has already done however so this whole faith thing um and th this I've, I've shared this as well in the last couple of weeks with you uh this famous quote by john wesley he he taught that and this is what he said he says god does nothing except in response to believing prayer and this i believe has caused that dysfunction in the church in christendom okay so it means that we must have faith in order for god to do something we must pray in order for god to do something but then that bypasses the cross it makes god reactive not proactive okay so this is just i've shared this before he was john wesley he found uh, the methodist denomination um, he was very popular in the 1700s he said a lot of great stuff but um unfortunately this is not one of them on the surface i don't think any believer would really question this they would go yep that's right um but when you look at the finished work of the cross and the new covenant it really does contradict it does so I think it's important that we um, we really learn to to really look at why we believe what we believe, um, and then we really just begin to break things down. So God does nothing expense except in response to believing prayer. And I've said here in my PowerPoint, really? <laughs> no, how many times? I'm sure you have too. That you have experienced a provision, and there's like a supernatural provision, and then the need happens you think oh my gosh i've got the need before you know i didn't even get to pray for that i've had that so many times in my life that i that it, then this is what got me to start thinking it's like hang on i've got this provision here you knew before it would happen you know the day or so after there was a lack or something happened but the provision it was already there and it just messed with my theology because it's like hang on i haven't even prayed yet i didn't even have the faith yet and god you already answered yes he did absolutely because he doesn't need us you know um god remember he's not reactive he's proactive he sent jesus jesus was manifested for you and for me before we were even born jesus was manifested before any man prayed amen jesus is god's best jesus is god's answer for you in every area of life and no one had to pray for jesus god did it all himself by himself through himself for all of mankind so that's why this uh quote doesn't really line up with the nature and character of the father 
Okay, always remember that finished work from the foundation of the world. Jesus was a lamb who was slain, we're told. Before Adam messed up in the heart and the mind of God, Jesus was already there. He'd already foreseen what was going to happen and uh, the provision was already there. God does not change. Jesus does not change. Jesus was in the heart and mind of God from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1.20 says, speaking of Jesus, it says he indeed was foreordained, which means predestined or predetermined before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay, so when you look at what faith is, and it's so important we understand what faith is, but also what faith isn't. Faith is simply our response to what God has already done through his son. Okay, faith connects us. Faith doesn't move God because God already moved. He already saved you before you were born. And through what Jesus did through the cross, he already provided not only your salvation, but your deliverance, your provision, your healing, and everything else you could need. That's already there. So your faith doesn't move him because he already moved. Faith moves you. Faith positions you to experience what God did over 2,000 years ago. And you know what? When we, we've gone through faith before, God gives us the faith. He's given and put eternity in the heart of every man. It's a gift of God, faith and salvation and everything that God did through his son. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. So not only did God save us and do it all himself, he gave us the faith we needed, which is the tool, I suppose, for a lack of a better way to say it, for us to respond to what he has done it's all him <laughs> it's not it's all him faith is our response okay so this is my faith 101 here faith is resting in god's ability and not your own so when it comes to salvation we know we cannot save ourselves by what we do it's not by our might it's not by our power it's not by how good we are it's by who how good jesus is and what jesus has freely done for us so if you were trying to build your faith, you're trying to grow your faith, you're trying to operate in faith or work your faith, then you know what? You're trusting in your own ability. You've left Jesus and trusting in Jesus alone. Okay, you get into self-effort and you know what? It can work to a certain extent, but you're only as good as how you feel. It's only as good as what you feel your faith or the level your faith is at. But the way for how we live our Christian life is exactly the same way of how we experienced salvation in the first place. It's a faith covenant. It's based on Jesus' performance and not our own. We're resting in what Jesus has already done for us. And remember, rest doesn't mean inactivity. It just simply means to stop striving in your own ability and let Jesus do it for you. So it's a spirit led activity. Okay. So not inactivity. When I say rest, I'm not saying, okay, I can spend my life like this. It's just stops trying to make it happen on your own through your relationship, go to him, let him equip and empower you bring by bringing revelation of what you need to do or not do. So then you can respond. Okay. So it's, it's his ability, not your own. You're just living and walking by the spirit. Colossians 2, uh, 6 to 7 in the New Living Translation says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. And then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Ain't that the truth? Excuse my grandma. It's all about Jesus and trusting in Jesus and resting in Jesus and your faith in him resting in him will grow because then you the more that you grow in the finished work of the cross the more you realize it's all about him and his ability and not yours i mean okay so last dysfunction i want to cover today is asking for forgiveness okay so we did a series last year on it and that's on our church uh, youtube and it's called the problem with sin and we went through this in a massive massive detail i think there was about three or four lessons where there was just scripture overload and uh, doctrine overload i believe <laughs> there's a lot that we we really compacted within those messages so if you're interested we can give you the links to that to, to see like a greater detail and a lot more like it's like five hours of teaching at least 
uh, on this point that I'm going to just make here. I cannot dot every I and cross every T uh, on this uh, part here, but um, I believe I'm giving you enough of the finish work to help you to move forward. I mean, this is a huge thing for most people. You know, like I mentioned, what I was taught at the beginning, the order of prayer is repent. Um, you know, again, we did a series on repentance. I want to redo that because we want to um, revisit that and have all those messages up on our YouTube channel. We believe that's a huge thing in the body of Christ that we need to unlearn and just to bring a blessing in our relationship with God. See, asking for forgiveness is a massive dysfunction in our relationship with God. Okay, why? Because we bypass the cross. We bypass Jesus. Jesus, if you stand before the Father and go, like, forgive me, Father, for I'm a sinner, you are approaching God on your own merit. You are approaching God by your own performance. You've bypassed the cross. You're not approaching him through faith in his son. It's that it, it, that is serious. We we It's an affront to the cross and what Jesus has done because Jesus was the payment for all sin. Amen. That's what Jesus has done for us. How we approach Father, the Father is through the Son. Just simply, just very, very simply begin and end each day through the cross. Jesus was enough for you. But unfortunately, we've been taught and the church has been taught, and this is why it's a huge dysfunction, is that God cannot hear us. God cannot respond us if we have any sort of sin in our life. And really, when you break that down, then none of us have a hope. Because we all have sin in our life. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that's what Romans 3, I think, 21 says, we've, or 23, I think, that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the very next verse says, but God has freely, you know, provided that forgiveness through Jesus. You know, through that, he was the propitiation for our sin, which is the atoning sacrifice, the one-off sacrifice for that whole sin um, a law breaking the law nature okay so if you feel that and a lot of people believe this but it's actually not the scriptural truth it's a man-made doctrine where a lot of people get this is from the first part of a scripture uh, that king david said and really if you buy into this you do not understand the new covenant you do not understand the finished work of the cross so in psalm uh, 60 uh, 56 verses 18 King David said, if I regard, if I hold iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Oh, I've lost count of how many messages I've heard taught on this. So you need to deal with sin. You know, even Billy Graham's um, um, model prayer of Acts, you know, cleanse yourself, get yourself right before God. It is dysfunctional because we buy past the cross. This is what King David said, you know, always look at who is saying what to whom and why, what covenant, et cetera, et cetera. However, if we just keep reading, it gets really exciting. So King David says in verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Verse 19, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. Amen. King David had an affair with Bathsheba, had the husband killed. It was, you know, what he did, he did, you know, he wasn't a perfect guy here, but he had a heart after God. He knew the nature and character of the Father. It's not a license to do whatever you, you want to do in your life. I am not saying that, so don't read into that. Jesus uh, came and paid the price for sin, not to live in it or to function in it but to deliver us from it, from it, to redeem us, to set us free. Okay. And so the, the new covenant is just walk with the spirit, be led by the spirit. Amen. So God, look at this King David, even though he messed up, he withdrew from God, not the other way around. He said, but you certainly heard me. You attended to the voice of my prayer. You did not turn away my prayer or your mercy from me. You know, the, the Bible tells us God's mercy is new every morning. The mercy always triumphs over judgment. We really need to understand the nature and character of our Father. Okay, so forgiveness 101. You know, we know this, don't we? I'm not going to read it out just to, to time. But um, Psalm 103, 103 talks about all the benefits of God, that he has uh, forgiven um, all our iniquities and he's healed all our diseases. 
You know, he's forgiven all our iniquities, our faults and our sins. And this is what we now have through Jesus and his finished work. This is pointing to what we have. Amen. And uh, if you keep reading in Psalm 103, look at this in verses 10 to 12. It says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities or our faults or our sins. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. And fear him means worship him, okay? As far as the east is from the west, is so far has he removed our transgressions from us you know uh why don't we teach that why do we teach if you have sin in your life god won't hear you it's rubbish this is what we need to be preaching look to jesus and the finished work as as far high as the heavens are from the earth as far as the east is from the west is as far as god has removed that sin nature from you yes we still fall short absolutely but the blood of jesus was more than enough for us amen okay did i cover everything was there so when you know the finished work of the cross and you understand god's unconditional love for you and and then you you know you understand what jesus has done through uh remember galatians 3 13 he's redeemed us we christ redeemed us from that curse of the law having become a curse for us remember he completed and fulfilled the law he made way for a new covenant um, which is a better covenant based on better promises which is based on faith faith in jesus performance and not our own thank god for that so when you know that and then when you allow the holy spirit to live in you and guide you and lead you that's simply how you walk in victory over that fallen nature and it really is reminding very simply just reminding yourself what jesus has already done romans 6 verse 14 and i love the new living translation here it says so sin is no longer your master for you no longer live under the requirements of the law instead you live under the freedom of god's grace and god's grace is his unmerited favor it's god having done everything for us through what jesus did on that cross as a gift not of works so none of us can boast it's a faith covenant we just begin and end each day at the cross so simple and it's a shame that that's not taught people are too scared of people sinning but you know what we need to get our eyes off other people and just focus on our own relationship and i believe if people understood the finished work of the cross and learned how to walk with the holy spirit we would see less crazy behavior amen the biggest lie in the church okay the biggest lie in christendom as a whole is uh, and i believe that satan planted this that there's something wrong with you you know that you're at fault that you've got sin in your life you need you're not praying enough you you you're not declaring the word enough you, you don't have enough faith you know whatever that is you're missing it somewhere you know and that's the thing it all of that causes us to have a lack mentality puts us on the pre-cross before the finished work of the cross so we start to strive we start to to, to try and move God and try to get what we've already done. That's the dysfunction that it causes, places us under the wrong covenant, causes us to lose sight of Jesus. Jesus is no longer enough for us, okay? And that's why it's the biggest lie because it causes that striving. You know, we then approach God based on our own performance. You know, God, I'm, I'm, I'm unworthy, I'm not loved, I'm not good enough rather than you know what i am more i am worthy and i'm loved because i believe in jesus my righteousness the gift of the holy spirit is imputed to me as a gift not of works so that i can't boast i believe in jesus and he's more than enough for me remember that you know there's no condemnation for those who in christ jesus how the father judges you how the father sees a new covenant believer is through the lens of his son the blood continually speaks on your behalf that you are washed you are cleansed you are justified you are glorified because of what jesus has done for you okay not by what you do not by how good you are not by you praying not by your faith not by you declaring the word not by you going to church not by you giving not by you having a prayer time not by you being a good overall person it's by believing and trusting in Jesus performance where you know and not your own 
God no longer judges us after the flesh when we're in Jesus. He looks at us after the spirit. So how he sees Jesus is how he sees you and me. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 17, and I love the New Living Translation again. Uh, it says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. We are new creations. Uh, this also says in uh, the New King James, we become new creations. The old is gone. The new has come. You know, new covenant, a better covenant. We now live and walk by the spirit. We now have the Holy Spirit gifted to us so we can live with him and walk with him. New creations. I mean, it's so important we understand this. It's, you know, incredible. Okay, so just, you know, the prayer, just wrapping and summarizing what I've shared today. I love what Jesus shared, you know, about prayer uh, in Matthew uh, chapter six. And he begins to share, before he shares what prayer is, he shares what prayer isn't. And I just want to read this out to you. This is the message translation. And I covered this, I think, at the end of my first message on the Lord's Prayer, because it's just spoken prior to, to the Lord's Prayer. And it says, and when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. Because prior to this, Jesus was talking about fasting and giving and talk, really addressing the Pharisees because they were doing everything before men. It was all based on appearance and it all looked good and fantastic. So he says, he, you know, so he covers those two, then he addresses prayer and he says, so don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think that God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you'll begin to sense his grace. 7 to 8 says, and the world is so full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. I mean, ain't that the truth? <laughs> They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. Okay, and remember prayer is communion or fellowship with God. It's spending time with him. It's not prayer. It's not asking for stuff. God is not petitioning God for stuff. It's not, you know, and you'll learn in the future lessons, it's not about warfare. It's not about, you know, doing all this, whatever. It's relationship, pro acumai, towards an exchange of where the Father reveals who he is to you. Remember, Jesus said, the spirit has taken from what belongs to the father and has made it known to me. And he's, and I'm paraphrasing and he says, and now I'm going to give you my spirit and he is going to take from what the father has and also make it known to you. And then he, and he adds to that. And then he says elsewhere, you know, he's going to take also everything that belongs to me, everything. And we look at what we have under the finished work and he's going to reveal it and he's going to dis disclose it. He's going to transmit it to you. Okay, the role of the spirit is to reveal what you already have through Jesus and the finished work. Okay, so remember prayer is communion. And, uh, you know, so I covered these five dysfunctions, uh, main dysfunctions, I believe, and that anything that causes us to get on the wrong side of the cross will cause a dysfunction in our prayer life and in our relationship with God. Okay, because it puts us on that wrong side, we get into lack rather than being in that seated position, looking at, hang on, Jesus, you've provided this for me. I just need revelation. I just really need to hear what to do or not do here. Um, okay, so that's really what uh, we need to stay with in prayer, into that parameter of what prayer is. And, and then know and just to stay seated then with Jesus. Once you've reminded yourself what Jesus has already done, remember to stay in that seated position. Really, at the end of the day, what I want you to learn through every single lesson that we share with you on prayer and beyond, right, is that Jesus, what he did on that cross was more than enough for you for any area of your life. 
And when you know that it's a complete and a perfect and a finished work, then I also want you to know that you cannot add to it. God does not expect you to add to it. You can't add to it. So please stop trying. (laughs) Please stop trying. God has done everything for you freely through his son. So please, I want you to renew your mind and and unlearn and be delivered from all the traditions and the doctrines of men so that you are left with Jesus and Jesus alone, so that you are left with communion and so that your relationship can then grow and flow. Amen. Amen.